Good evening. My name is Matthew Bronfman, and I have the pleasure of serving on the board of the 92nd Street Y, and I'm also co-chair of the Jewish Life Committee. I am happy to welcome everyone who is joining us online for our program this evening. Elie Wiesel, the Nobel Prize laureate and one of the most respected figures in Jewish life in the 20th and 21st centuries, first spoke at the 92nd Street Y on February 19th, 1967, at a reading at the Underberg Poetry Center of his book, The Town Beyond the Wall. From then on, over almost five decades, he enlightened audiences with his readings and commentaries on some of his own works, sometimes giving them their first public airing. Over the course of 47 years, he delivered 180 lectures. We have gained immeasurably from his wisdom. Tonight, the 92nd Street Y is honored to launch the Elie Wiesel Living Archive at 92Y, a repository for his recorded presentations from 1967 to 2014, made possible by a generous grant from the Elie Wiesel Foundation for Humanity. The archive will provide free online access for scholars and students to an unparalleled resource for the study and appreciation of Elie Wiesel's life and work and allow people of all backgrounds and ages access to a multimedia exploration of his lectures, readings, and conversations focusing on Jewish learning and tradition, chronicling his pursuit of justice, and contextualizing his unwavering belief in the power of humanity. I am proud to introduce our panel this evening. Peter J. Rubenstein, is the Senior Vice President of Jewish Community and Managing Director of the Bronfman Center for Jewish Life at the 92nd Street Y. He is also the Rabbi Emeritus of Central Synagogue, or Reform Congregation, where he served as Senior Rabbi for 23 years. Joining him is Alicia Wiesel, son of late Elie Wiesel. Since retiring from a 25-year financial markets career at Goldman Sachs, Alicia has advised several startups in the fintech space and chairs the Elie Wiesel Foundation and continues his father's legacy by standing up for persecuted communities. Joining them is Dr. Avraham Rosen, who is the author and editor of 14 books. He is most recently the editor of Elie Wiesel's recently published book, Filled with Fire and Light, Portraits of Legends from the Bible, Talmud, and Hasidic World. Dr. Rosen was also a student of Elie Wiesel and our project scholar for the archives. Together, they will share insights and appreciation of Elie Wiesel's remarkable work at 92Y and discuss the newly launched archives. Please join me and have a wonderful evening. Thank you. I'd like to welcome all of you here and I want to extend a special note of gratitude to Matthew Bronfman uh, for his very kind introduction of the three of us. Uh, we're about to announce during this program the extraordinary uh, unveiling and launching of the Elie Wiesel Living Archives at the 92nd Street Y, an extraordinary undertaking. And I wonder, Alicia, as his son, uh, what import do you see in this? And how did this all begin? That's great. And I want to say thank you not only to Matthew and to yourself, Rob Peter, but to Andrew and Chelsea and really the, the terrific work by the 92nd Street Y staff in making this happen, as well as our dedicated team at the Elie Wiesel Foundation, Marissa and Olivia uh, and Mina. So many folks came together and it's been it's been fantastic. The idea behind the archive was to find that unique partnership that was possible with the 92nd Street Y and the Elie Wiesel Foundation on a very specific mission, which is to preserve my father's voice and make it more accessible to those who, um, who would want to learn from him that didn't necessarily have the chance, as so many audiences over the course of four decades did, to sit in that auditorium to see what he could accomplish with nothing more than a table, a glass of water, a microphone in his chair, the spell that he could cast, the unbelievable richness of, of story and moral urging that only he had such a way of producing. And the 92nd Street Y is now releasing these clips, these transcripts, both audio and video, all of this incredible data that's been collected and made it possible to experience it in a searchable way. This is really what we wanted at the outset and we're thrilled that it's come to fruition. And so are we. Uh, Rav Abraham, you've been part of the circle of Elie Wiesel's life uh, for many years. Uh, how did that happen and what drew you in? 
Uh, thank you, Peter. Um, I uh, was aiming to become a scholar of the Holocaust. And uh, that's what drew me to Boston and came to uh, Professor Wiesel, as I call him. Uh, his uh, class in fall of 1978 and was in his, had the privilege of being in his classroom for 10 years, eight of which I was a, his teaching assistant. And even after I finished, I never finished. As he said about uh, his fourth lecture of the Akedah, he said, it's called revisiting the Akedah. But really, have we ever left? And I can say that, that I never left his classroom. So we continued to be close. We would speak every month on Rosh Chodesh, the, the celebration of the beginning of the Jewish month. I would confer with him on all of my projects and decisions. And uh, I had the privilege of orchestrating his 70th uh, birthday conference and 80th birthday conference um, and, uh, uh, and five books now that uh, uh, are dedicated to different aspects of Professor Huizel's work. So when I was invited to join this incredible team in this visionary project of the 92nd Street Y, it was for me a, a continuation of where I had been before. But that said, to sit and to learn again from Professor Huizel delivering these lectures, which he called transmitting Torah from the Bible, Tanakh, Talmud, Hasidism, and then reading from his own works as they appeared or were going to appear. It was a whole nother level, a whole new sense of entering into Professor Wiesel's orbit as a student of a great sage. You know, he gave 180 lectures, uh, talks uh, at the 92nd Street Y, but um, uh, I wonder what the, the feeling of sitting in a room or in a lecture hall, uh, in the hall at the 92nd Street Y, what, what was the experience of being there? You said he would sit at a table with a glass of water and a light and probably his papers. But what, what was the audience, the congregation feeling? Because I think it really was his congregation. It's a great question, Rob Peter. The, he really opened the door, I think, in many ways with these lectures for secular Jews to engage with biblical and Talmudic texts. If you looked around, you didn't see a lot of folks in Hasidic garb. You didn't see even a lot of kippot srugot. You didn't see a lot of people wearing yarmulkes necessarily. There were some, but it was not an overwhelming amount. These were people who had been drawn to hear my father's story and hear him engage with what he loved. And I really believe that so much of what was happening on that stage was it was not just an analytical mind approaching intellectual topics. He was approaching these topics with his heart and that it was his emotion that really took people along on this journey of wherever he was choosing to go on that evening. And what did he expect of, of us? the ones that were sitting in those chairs. I, I have a feeling that he, he wanted us to do some work too. Well, the first thing he expected, and this is something, by the way, that I've taken into my business life, he expected people to be on time. And uh, you know, <laughs> he would go out of his way to sort of draw out early in each lecture. He would find a poetic way to reopen the doors and then all the late people would have to shuffle in you know, very, vis very visibly. Uh, so, so he certainly so getting Jews to be on time is kind of a messianic uh, vision. Wow, that's unbelievable. <laughs> Absolutely, um, but I think he expected us to 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 follow him and to bring our own questions. You know, my father loved questions more than he loved answers, and he loved to answer a question with a question. These were the these were the things that he absolutely loved doing, and I believe that that's what Rav Avraham got to see in the classroom, working with him for so many years. And it's what he loved and encouraged with the lectures. He 
you know, with my father, there's the, um, I always like to say that there's the, um, the, the Torah She Bichtav, there's what's written now by my father and, and what we've observed. And I think that in many ways, these lectures are now part of his Torah She Bichtav, the, uh, the written and visible legacy of my father. But there was also the Torah She Bel Peh, uh, the oral tradition of the Torah. And what you didn't see is that after the lectures, my father would be in that receiving room just near the auditorium. And he would talk to anybody and everybody who had a question, a story about some fourth cousin seven times removed through which they were related, <laughs> uh, a story of personal experience of what they had encountered in some completely different foreign area of the world or culture and how they related it. And if they had either a story or a question, my father was there to hear it and to make them feel heard. And I think that is what happened after each 92nd Street Y lecture that really in many ways defines who he was for me. You know, as a friend, I met him in the, in the 70s. That was a long time ago. When I, uh, and I, my sense was that he didn't change persona when he got up on, on that stage. I mean, he was himself. And, uh, but he wanted us to enter his universe in some way. And he was inviting us in as though opening a door. And, but he, there was some work we had to do once we were in that door. I think that's right, because my father had an expectation that there would be some scholarly work and research here. And the truth of the matter is, my father viewed these lectures, I believe, as a chance to do something he loved, which was to study. And more than that, to study with his teacher when Rav Lieberman was alive, to, to be able to turn to him for some of these studies and to turn to other friends and colleagues who were studying as well at later points. And for him, this was a labor of love, and we were all invited in to, to play a part in it. Uh, Rabbi, you know, um, I love reading your book. Uh, this is not a solicited, uh, you know, advertisement uh, filled with fire and light. Um, uh, and I, I wonder, you know, obviously the Holocaust and memory of the Holocaust was part of his mission, right? Uh, how did yes. that affect? How did that affect you personally, and how did it affect the other people who would come and listen to him or study with him? He was Professor Wiesel was a teacher first and foremost, and a witness first and foremost, and those uh, merged together in his eloquence, his uh, determination to remember his teaching us uh, to, as far as we were uh, capable to remember and to go forward. So that it, it, I think we could think of a, a, a Professor Wiesel and other survivors, which he modeled, I think for many as being uh, living in the past, but he was keenly determined to go into the future. And he taught us that as well, meaning we had a mission to uh, go forward, to continue the legacy that um, had been under siege during the time of the Holocaust and uh, to take it e each in our own way and to live it. So uh, there's always uh, traces in each and every book of uh, the memory of what was before. And there were links to the Hurban Bey Samikdash, to the destruction of the temples and the way that Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai responded and the choices he made that clearly were setting a, um, a pattern and a precedent. And Professor Wiesel would dig into those with uh, just such uh, determination, such searching. So I think for me, what to take away was both the commitment to the memory of those who were lost, but equally and, and probably more, the, uh, the quest to go forward, to learn, to be a chassid, certainly in my case, 
coming from a secular background and walking into his classroom and spending 10 years there worked a, an extraordinary transformation. And Professor Huizel's first words in his first wide lecture are, I am a chosset. He said, you may not believe it because he was not dressed as a conventional chassid, maybe be pictured to be dressed, but he identified uh, a, in a full way, uh, always as being a visionizer chassid, the chassidus, the chassidism that his family came from in uh, the in Sigat, and uh, he continued to teach us that. At his 70th birthday, conference, we, he, during the dinner there, he taught everyone assembled, Vijnitzer Niguni. So there were 200, 300 people that he was directly like the choir director that he was teaching these Niguni to each and every person. And they responded. Yeah, you know, you think of the image of a conductor. I mean, he was, uh, in a certain way, uh, a conductor uh, for any of us who ever came into his presence. And, and I'm truly, I think the part of the brilliance of him is that he didn't stay stuck in the past, and he he would pivot to the present and and to the future. Uh, and I I'm especially in you know these times these days with the events that we're we're facing and that every generation faces. He had something to say about it. He he carried that past with us as a a lesson, but a paradigm for how we could think about what's going on in our present life and and the future. And and so Alicia, how did how did he work these these talks out? How did it happen? Listen, I, I am the wrong person to opine exactly on what his creative process was, other than I know it started very early in the morning. My father was always the first one up in the house, and he would make himself instant coffee. No matter what fancy brewers or beans I got, he couldn't shake himself from uh, what he had learned to do after the war, which was to make, you know, pour in the packet, put in the hot water and stir. Um Although I, I, you know, I tried many times to upgrade his coffee drinking, he uh, he would go into his office and he would start to and he would start to work. And I think earlier in life, everything he did was longhand first. He did ultimately get more comfortable, I think, with a typewriter and then and then the word processor as a way to work. But he would do many edits. Um, sometimes he wrote in French first, in which case he would ask my mother for help translating. Uh, I do. I have seen him also compose directly in English. But he would, the most important thing I think to note about the 92nd Street Y lectures that, that these were heavily, heavily researched and revised pieces. Yes. These were not light off the cuff thoughts where he was, you know, just hoping he'd be able to pull something interesting from the memory banks. He would write a draft, he would write a skeleton. And then I have folders, I have thick folders, one per each lecture. And you could just see the clippings he would take from scholarly journals or from newspapers around current events that excited him, little post-its with a hundred different ideas. Each one of these coalesced and then were heavily revised to become the lectures that they became. You know, I, I know he taught uh, at uh, City College, he taught at Boston University, very you know significant talks. And, and I also understand uh, that he would often give a talk in more than one place, but that it was different. It was always different. Even though it was the same talk, it was different. Um, did he work on this in his head, you know, as events were happening in the world, as he was evolving and so on? The way I prefer to see it is my, there were always events happening and therefore there were always thoughts happening inside my father's head, whether it was actions that we needed to take or reflections that, that stirred him. And wherever he was, whatever talk he was giving, I think his method was the same. He opened a door and let us in some of the way. Uh, Alan, Rav Abraham, you, you studied with him at BU. Uh, you, you attended many, you probably attended many of his talks up there. Um, yes. Do you remember the first one that you attended? I went to the talks after being in his classroom. In other words, he would be at Boston University, would come in usually either two days a week or a single day a week and pack everything in 
from morning to night, including his classroom teaching and his lecture. So I would be very much with the books we were studying in the classroom, some of which were uh, Jewishly focused and others uh, were uh, circling around the great literature of the world. And uh, so much of that was taken with me to the evening lectures as well. So when, you, when you're asking that, that it, it really had me be still, even though I attended the lectures, whether they would be on uh, the prophet Ezekiel, or it would be on Rabbi uh, Zaira, that still I would also walk in with Dostoevsky and Camus in my head from the classroom. Mm -hmm. um, it, what to mention, Reb Peter, also, you, you kindly mentioned what you said was my book, but it really, it's not my book. I had the privilege of editing what were unpublished lectures in English and bringing them out uh, last year. But uh, it's Professor Rizel's book. It's his words. It's his teachings. And uh, it, it's very important to my mind to say that the 92nd Street Y became the conduit for the great books on Jewish teachings uh, that he uh, that he brought into being on the 25th anniversary of giving lectures at the Y. He, Professor Wiesel, put 25 of selected lectures into that book that had not been previously published. And the preface to the book is really uh, explicitly that kind of tribute. So as we're watching the lectures and hearing his voice and being with him in the study, we also can move back and forth to the books that are on our shelves or should be on our shelves or will be on our shelves. Um, and with the added addition, the Professor Wiesel uh, always in each and every lecture, which was chiseled as Rebbe Lisha had said, chiseled, but that he would pause for maybe two minutes four minutes, five minutes, and give what he called preliminary remarks, where there were thank yous to the staff at the 92nd Street Y, to his beginning in 1983, to his assistants, who would convene uh, anywhere between 150 to 300 attendees of the lectures in the afternoon, and studied the primary text with him. Yeah, that I mean, I began in 1983 and went forward. So these, just to finish, Peter, yeah. with that, these preliminary remarks opened wide not only the doors to the latecomers, as Reb Alicia had mentioned, but also opened the doors wide to the world. And Professor Wiesel would comment on each and every dimension of the world as it impinged on Jewish life, but not only Jewish life. And would also, that would be a time where he would um, share with the audience personal stories about his family, friends, past, future. You know, he, he obviously became much more than a teacher of the people in his immediate presence. I mean, he became a teacher, I think, to society and civilization, ultimately. Sure. Uh, and, I, and I think he was on it for that. And we'll talk about that uh, in, in a couple of minutes. But I, I, I remember the first time I read Night. Uh, and, and it was the first time I was so moved by something that someone else read, uh, wrote 
uh, that I can remember where I was. And I, you know, as a you know congregation rabbi, I made every confirmation kid make sure that they read it. I talked about his work probably more than anybody anybody else uh, in our history. And and I and especially I love the story uh, that he talked when Moses died and with the Nishikad Elohim and you know how Moses fought against you know his his life ending when it did. Um, uh, but ultimately, he was a chronicler of the Holocaust, and you know, and and that became part of his extraordinary legacy. But I think that Holo the, his experience of the Holocaust and his books about it were intended for something other than just bemoaning the past. Um, and I, I wonder, uh, Alicia, did he did he talk about what his his motives were in writing his books and you know and the and in his teachings. My father wanted to connect with readers. He wanted them to have questions and and react and be provoked and to think. It's interesting because we have been approached by I can't tell you how many different filmmakers who want to do a film version of Night. And my father could not have been clearer. He left very specific instructions. He did not want any adaptations. He wanted only the experience of his words reaching the reader as he had written them and as he meant for them to reach the reader. He wanted to have a very intimate experience with his reader. He was bearing his soul and he thought that there were questions to be asked. I'm not even going to say lessons to be learned because he was always more focused on, on the questions and on provoking them. So I think he wanted to, he wanted to, to put out there what had happened to him and say, this is not something to be ignored. You have to remember that the first publishers that he had approached all dismissed Knight, saying nobody wants to hear about this. It's too dark, too depressing. Um, and thankfully, Hill and Wang saw differently and, and were able to move forward. He went on to speak about other terrible things that were happening in the world at the present. I think that's, you know, was at the root of his receiving the Nobel Peace Prize in 1986. What was his, did he ever share his, his feelings about that, his impression of, of being placed in this rather august setting and giving his talk? You know, he actually mentions it. I think, I can't remember if it's in the speech or, or if he says it afterwards, but he has, a, he has a vision that, you know, his father is there with him as I am standing next to him. It was a very emotional moment to, to think about his role as testifying. He was not someone who was ridden with guilt, with survivor's guilt. He didn't say, it's not fair. I didn't, you know, why should I have survived? I don't deserve this. He didn't, you know, if he felt that from time to time, he didn't harp on it. He took a different tack, which is given that he had survived, he felt a need to do something to justify that and make his life have meaning. And for him, that was remembering the Jewish lives that had existed before the Shoah, remembering his family, living their values, uh, and also to take those values and firmly plant them into the rest of the world, to say, this is how I do things and why I do things because of what I was brought up with. So I think that when my father occupied a role in larger affairs, he did so fully grounded in his Jewishness, and that gave him real meaning. You know, I want to make mention of your mom, because she, he, she was part of the story as well, as, you know, even from the very beginning, um, and, uh, you know, was by his side when so much of this was happening. And Listen, my, my, father, my father was, you know, an author and a journalist and a teacher, but I think without my mother, my father would never have navigated the complex, messy world that one must navigate in order to have an impact on thousands or millions of people. And her love for him, her clarity of vision, whether she was translating his French into English or whether she was helping him understand who can you trust, who can you not trust, how do you make progress in this, in this tricky world, uh, she was extremely loyal to him and still is. Yeah. Uh, Rabbi Abraham, when you were studying with him, did he have expectations of his students, significant expectations of his students? Yes. Uh, he, he, he loved us. That was clear. He supported us uh, unstintingly. But he had uh, expectations that his students would be 
teachers, one kind or another. Certainly my strong impression was that there was a, a certain kind of debt of studying with him, as is, I think, true with any great teacher, that one is carrying forward their words, their projects, their, their vision, while certainly translating it into one's own talents and aptitudes, which were, in my case, so far from uh, Professor Wiesel's uh, reach and uh, eloquence, but still, there was a sense that this is, this is what needed to be done. I think too, as, as teachers, Reb Peter, when we say that it, it, it's true that Professor Wiesel was a, a great, perhaps the greatest chronicler of Holocaust memory. And, uh, and that, that has been tri played, played tribute to. But I think what's the, the so many other sides as a teacher of Jewish uh, tradition, of Torah, of, um, of someone with an A, uh, uh, the sharpest and deepest and most uh, captivating sense of humor of anyone I've met. Alicia will be able to speak to this, I trust equally well, but certainly in our classroom, there was just laughter, uh, a, a sense of uh, pleasure at study, at jokes, at stories. And the wide lectures present that. They open up that uh, uh, extraordinary side that if one didn't have that, we would be missing a lot. So I think he had expectations that his students would also become, would, would be serving if they were Jews and there were many non-Jews who were also um, dedicated students, but if they, whoever they were, they would serve their communities to not in a dour sense, not in a, in a, a bringing sadness, but rather bringing joy. Uh, the, uh, uh, another dimension of the lectures and of Professor Wiesel for, for students was uh, uh, Israel, the people of Israel and also the land of Israel. That when I was deciding whether to, uh, to accept the teaching position that I was invited to in Israel, the way that he, he was certainly uh, Gung Ho, he spent uh, uh, many, many, many visits and time in Eretz Israel. He built a, uh, together with Rabbi Menashe Klein, built a yeshiva to the memory of his father and family in Jerusalem. And uh, his wide lectures began uh, just before the 67 war. And when he came back in the fall afterwards, it, he had already been to Israel at the time of the war. I think it's the case, Alicia, you'll be able to verify this, that he, every war that Israel unfortunately had to fight, Professor Wiesel took the next plane out and was there in support. And that comes through in the wide lectures again and again singing of Yerushalayim, being of Jerusalem, being at the center of the, his vocation, the vocation of a Jew. So I think it was true as a student too, that, we, that uh, we either went to Israel if you were a Jewish student or even if you weren't. And that even if you couldn't live there, that Jerusalem would be what you orbited around. So, you know, it's interesting, just a quick story on the topic of Israel. I, I was writing an op-ed or, or something. I was writing some piece that was, you know, reasonably political. And the, uh, the, the newspaper that I was putting it in was pushing back, I think, on my characterization of, uh, of my father as a Zionist and certain things that he'd done that were Zionist in tone. And uh, having the lectures at my disposal was pretty amazing because I was able to go through them and find some of these places and pull out yes. these very strong statements that he made sure. for anybody who, sure. who wants to have this concept that my father was not a Zionist. You know, you have these 
uh, incredible lectures where he, he's extremely passionate and articulate uh, about the concept. So it was amazing to have that as a resource to draw on in the heat of my own battle, um, as it were. Uh, you know, I think you'd asked earlier about, um, or you'd made the comment about my father and the humor with which he did things. And Rav Peter, you had asked about how did my father position himself on the world stage? How did he feel? I just had to share the story that when my father was uh, was knighted by the, um, you know, in England, he received KBE. You know, he gets up in front of this room full of dignitaries. Uh, and of course, he, he, in a very deadpan fashion, says, why is this night different from all other nights? Uh, <laughs> in, in every iteration, you know, both humor, but also reminding people who he was. And, you know, the last thing I just want to say on this topic is, you know, I'm glad you brought up Israel. We've already discussed how this, these are very Jewish archives. In the conversations that I had with my father near the end of his life, uh, he was very clear with me. He said, the only thing that matters in terms of how I am remembered, I want to be remembered as a good Jew. That's it. Nikuda. That was the only thing he said. So There's so much to double click on and unpack it. That meant so much to him, but it meant standing up for people in trouble around the world. And it also meant doing everything that he did Jewishly. So I think these archives occupy an incredible role in perpetuating that. So let me transition from what you just said, um, because I think it's important. So we have these archives now. Um, uh, who among the people uh, that are listening to us today, uh, who would use it and why? What, what, what is your vision for how these archives are going to be used? And, and uh, do you imagine it for scholars alone or for students alone? Tell us why and for whom. It, it's a great question. I, you know, there are, are um, there are the Boston University archives, which I should mention exist as well. So this becomes one of a number of archives that I think are ultimately going to be uh, created of my father's material. And I think serious scholars who want to understand my father, what he thought about things, how he reacted to current events in those early preliminary remarks, how, uh, how, how he operated in the context of the world around him, there's an incredible treasure trove and also biblical scholars and Talmudic scholars uh, to see the way that my father follows different threads of the uh, Moraim or the Tanaim or, or biblical figures and what he expounds on, what he chooses to put the focus on. There's a lot for serious scholars, I think, to go through and find in these archives. But there's also a lot for the person who's a scholar only a few hours a day or only a few hours a week, or maybe a few hours a month, a scholar who is fascinated by my father, fascinated by the world of Judaism, fascinated by this four decade period that the archive covers, the, the curious and the passersby, I think we'll find a lot there. And I have to tell you that last Lagba Omer, when I was trying to learn more about the holiday, go a little bit deeper into the Jewish calendar, and to learn then more about Rav Shimon Bar Yochai, um, I actually went for a nice long walk and with my earbuds in my ears, listened to my father deliver a lecture about Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. What a lecture it was. It was like being transported to another time and another place to, to be immersed. He really brought one of these figures to life uh, in a way that few others could. We're going to uh, be coming close uh, to our need to conclude. Um, I, I want to give uh, Rav Avraham uh, uh, the last word. Um, but I think of these archives, you know, your father used to talk every once in a while about the bot coal, the echo, right, the echo. And, and I have what I, I perceive these archives to be because I've been reading some of the transcripts and so on. It's just that for him. It, it, it carries his voice forward uh, to generations who may never have seen him except in the clips that are going to be available of these talks and which I know uh, are going to be uh, uh, part of this presentation. Uh, but it, his, his voice will echo, I believe, uh, in so many ways uh, throughout, throughout history. It was his, his words were so profound, so searing, uh, so educational that, uh, yeah, yeah you, you, you learn to fall in love, not only with a man, but for what, fall in love with what he said. You'd, you'd mentioned Baskal, and I want to just riff on that for, for one moment, because one of the things that makes me very happy about this project that I just thought of when you when you use that phrase 
is there's this moment in, uh, in, in the Talmud where there's an argument going on about whether or not a, a piece of pottery that is broken can be reassembled. And there's all sorts of implications for what it means. It's political discourse about the reformation of the state of Israel, or is it that we should go to Yavne and can you pursue it? Can you keep going in Yavne as a, as a new tradition? There's all these rich undertones going on, but it's a profound debate. And, uh, and the, the rabbis who are arguing are calling up to Shamayim, they're calling up to the heavens to weigh in and different miracles are occurring. And, the, and at the end of the day, the, the people down below who are debating this issue, they're not convinced by any heavenly miracles. They have their view and they've determined what is halacha, what is the right way to go. And, uh, and the voice comes down that, you know, my children, you have bested me. And, and there's, I think, a certain joy that my father would feel not in the answers that we take from him and then conclude, but in whatever questioning and discussioning and, and debating and enriching that we do with these archives, I think serves the memory of my father, quite well, and I believe will bring him joy. Rav, Avraham, your work isn't finished. You know, we have you involved in these archives and we'll probably keep you involved in these archives going forward for your research and brilliance and your firsthand experience. So let's hear from you. What do you want? Thank God. Thank God. I look forward to it. It's been such a privilege. And uh, the support of the, as you know, Peter, of the Y of the Eloise Health Foundation with now Alicia, uh, Rebel Alicia at the helm, and uh, his mother is certainly paving the way for that, uh, is extraordinary. I couldn't imagine a way to be able to push the legacy of my teacher into the dark corners of the world. I think first that uh, uh, gratitude was one of Professor Guizel's uh, central teachings. To be a Jew is to be grateful. And so uh, that uh, there's so much to say in that regard of the thanks continuing. Uh, but just to the personnel that, that I've been, uh, uh, had on my team, uh, uh, Jillian, uh, Davidson, who uh, worked with the summaries with me and with uh, Yiddish translation, much else, much, much else, dedicated and um, just shrewd in all judgments. Also, we were preceded by Jan Katz and Amanda Weiss um, and their contributions um, were important. I think, Alicia, you mentioned that Dove Seidman uh, played a an important role in the early stages, and we should give thanks to, to him Absolutely. and his uh, ongoing work with the Wiesel Foundation, Professor Wiesel's uh, both, legacy. Both, both Dove, both Dove Seidman Dove Seidman and, and Howard Sobel were very influential in bringing this partnership between the 92nd Street Y and the Ellie Wiesel Foundation to bear. I think it's really crucial to have a sense that Professor Wiesel titled all of his books on Jewish studies from the first to the last that he wrote in French and had the prerogative to title Celebration. And that the, the, the wide lectures that uh, we're right now is celebrating are to be able to help an extremely broad range of viewer and listener to celebrate Torah, Jewish tradition, the study, the Midrash and Talmud that Professor Wiesel brought, and that certainly did not present as a closed, uh, closed to only those who were uh, masters but also to the students. So that our being able through the good graces of the 92nd Street Y and the Yelly Wiesel Foundation, our, our opportunity now to sit at the feet of the master is something that is truly a celebration in the essential meaning that I think Professor Wiesel wanted to convey.
Rabbi Avraham, you uh, sat before your teacher and, and our friend uh, for many of his lectures and even more of his talks. Um, which of those, if you, if I could ask in a somewhat presumptuous, which of those come to mind? Uh, because it would be wonderful if we could share some of those moments uh, with, with this audience. Well, thanks so much, Rip Peter. There's so many. I mean, we have uh, up and running right now 128 lectures that go from 1967 to 2014. I think having a, a, a glimpse at least of one of the early lectures from 1967, the first year that Professor Huizel began to lecture. And I would say in, in that series, the last of the series called Modern Legends. In Jewish history, everything is connected. Isaac has been sacrificed and saved, more often sacrificed and saved but more than once. The word spoken and heard 3,000 years ago affects us today. The temple in flames is part of our daily reality. The promise made to Abraham is still weighing on our will to survive. The legends of the Talmud, the legends of the Midrash, are not mythological in character, not for us. They are alive. Another lecture to recommend is Tales of Today, Words of Remorse and Hope. There's special comments, special uh, deviations, one might say that Professor Huizel introduces, special innovations that really allow for just a, an openness of his a capacious mind to be able to be shared with us in new and exciting ways. We have learned the exquisite beauty of Talmudic dialogue and its intrinsic emphasis on tolerance. When the schools of Shammai and Hillel disagreed on a certain subject, a heavenly voice was heard saying that Eile ve Eile divrei Elohim chayim, meaning both sides are right which reminds us, of course, of a Sholem Aleichem story about a rabbinic judge, a Dayan, who listened to a plaintiff and was so taken by his argument about the poverty of his family that he told him, of course, you are right. What? yelled the other plaintiff. How can you say that, Rabbi? And he told him of his family troubles. A sick child, a lost, a lost child, a sick father, and so, in an outburst of pity, the Diane said, you are right too. And the rabbit who was present at the hearing could repress her astonishment. How can both be right, she said. Her husband looked at her and said, you, you know what? You are also right. <laughs> but how is that possible in the case of Shammai and Hillel? If both are right, doesn't it mean that both are wrong? No, it does not. If both are wrong, both might inspire disrespect. The opposite is true, since both are right and quote their words being the living words of God, they all deserve respect. Isn't that the noble significance of tolerance? That the other side deserves respect, that the other side may be right, that the other side too may say, my words are the words, the living words of God. Our final, uh, uh example of which could be many is the lecture Come Celebrate, which took place in uh, spring of 2006. And uh, it marked, again, an anniversary, the 40th year that Professor Wiesel had lectured at the Y. And at the end of the lecture, come and celebrate. Professor Wiesel shares with the audience what he does three times over the course of the lectures, which is to sing a Hasidic nigun, in this case, as well as the two of the others, the Vizhnitz, uh 
Nigan that he learned during the war to the uh, Maimonides formulation of Anima Min Bemun of Shlema of Vias Hamashiach, I believe with complete faith in the coming of Mashiach, of the Messiah. And Professor Wiesel sings that with, as is, was his uh, way with delicacy, passion, fervor is the word that I think he would use. And that concludes with a sense of such uplifting, uh, uplifting inspiration that I think we're all carried to where we need to go. Yani mamin Bemuna Shelema Beviat Hamashiach Ani Mamin Bemuna Shelema Beviat Hamashiach Yafal Pihi Shayit Mameha I want to thank um, the two of you. I also want to add to the list of those to be thanked from the Y, Chelsea Bassman, I think Alicia mentioned before, and Andrew Krukop, who was going to lead uh, the listeners uh, through a t tutorial. Thank you, Rabbi Rubenstein. Um, I'm Andrew Krukoff, Vice President of Digital Production at the 92nd Street Y, and I'm going to give you a quick tour of the Ellie Wiesel Living Archive. So, which you can get here through our website in our archive section. You can also get here by going to 92y.org slash Ellie Wiesel. So, we're here on the landing page. Scroll down, get to the main section. First off, like any website, we've got a search. So, you can search just the Ellie Wiesel archives on our site. Put in any term you want to. Um, we have an about page and biography. I won't go into those, but hopefully you will. Um, they're very detailed, uh, very good information. Um, let me show you this events tab. So the idea is to give you many different ways to explore the archive. And on this page, the events page, we have a listing of all of the events that we have in chronological order, beginning with this first one on February 19th, 1967, scrolling down all the way to his last appearance on November 20th, 2014. So this gives you a nice chronological uh, listing of the archive. We also have teaching resources. The idea here is to provide lesson plans for teachers to lead a class through the lectures. So I'll just click on one of these to give you an example. Here's for a general audience, and we have a lesson plan for three different lectures. And you can download the lesson and a handout, and along with a watch link for the lecture, and you can go through it. Um, also, definitely want to point out that you should also visit the Elie Wiesel archive online out of the Boston University. Roughly around the same time he was giving talks at 92i, he gave talks at Boston University, similar but different, and they have their own ar archive of recordings. It's definitely a great complimentary resource. We have a books page, and this is a exhaustive list of all the books published by Elie Wiesel. And what's nice about this feature on this page is many of his 92i lectures then became uh, published in his books. And then you can also click all of his Y lectures that are in books are, are hyperlinked. And we also have a list of his original French language publications. Another way to explore the site is we have these eight main categories, uh, anniversary and commemorations, conversations, Hasidism, Holocaust, moral and spiritual reflections, readings, Talmud, and Tanakh Bible. 
And then we have our featured section. Um, important here, we have featured talks that we hope that you'll explore. Um, we also have, and the first is Jewish holidays and observances. And here is where we have aggregated lectures and commentary that Professor Wiesel has made on the various holidays and observances across his lectures. So let's look at an individual lecture page. So here on an individual lecture page, this one, for example, in the Bible, Daniel in the Lion's Den, which was recorded on October 6, 1988, here you'll get a summary of the lecture. You'll have audio or video of the lecture itself played here. You can download a transcript. We've got selected quotes that you can scroll through. There's about 10 for each of these. We break down sub-themes for the lectures. And then lots of names, keywords, and categories that you can click on. And this is how we cross-reference other, other talks. So for example, here's a tag for Job. Let's see how many other talks there are for Job. And here are all the other talks that also mention Job. So it's another great tool to explore across the archive. And one thing I do want to mention, so that when you do play the video, make sure you turn on closed captioning right here, and it will play the captions as he is speaking. This story, beautiful and disturbing, is about children. Just another way for ease of use while browsing the archive. We have a glossary of Jewish and Talmudic terminology you'll encounter in Professor Wiesel's lectures. Thank you, and I hope you find as much meaning browsing the Ellie Wiesel Living Archive as we did in creating it. Thank you. My, my sense is your dad, Alicia, uh, your teacher, Rav Abraham, um, gave us a gift. Uh, what you've given us through these archives is a continuing unwrapping and of that gift. Uh, so for every generation, they're going to find the nuggets of truth and wisdom and love and, and memory that your father uh, implanted in his talks, uh, they're going to receive them anew. So thank you both for what you do, what you continue to do, and uh, for being part of this conversation. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Rabbi Lisha.